I say it's totally worth having this building getting beat up like crazy all week long, and we'll lose the screen for 110 kids singing to Christ. Right? Come on. How about we get a little less and they get a little more? You know, I came down. I came down Friday. I had the afternoon free, and I, so Lynn and I thought, let's go down and we'll help clean up. We just know, like, Diana and Carrie have just worked so tirelessly, and all the volunteers, I mean, literally 80 volunteers. <laughs> so I thought, I'll come down a little bit early, like 11.30, and just to hear, like, 110 kids in this sanctuary. If you don't want to volunteer, but you don't want to get caught, you could sneak in around 11, 11.30 during VBS and just, it just, this place is reverberating. It's so powerful. The, the only thing I will tell you is, I showed up and Karen was, where's Karen? I saw Karen. She was in the lobby and she was cleaning up the lobby. I said, oh, let, let me help you clean up the lobby. And she goes, what are you doing here? And then Lyon saw me. What are, what are you doing here? And then Heather, what are you doing here? Person after person kept saying the same thing to the extent where it was, a little shaming, quite frankly. <laughs> I, I, I felt like this massive schlep, like, do I do nothing around this place? Do I do so little that when I show up for one event to try to clean up, people are like, wow. Doug. People were literally, I watched people were saying, Doug's here. <laughs> like, man, oh, man. So I just want to let you know, apparently, if you don't volunteer on a regular basis, there is the tunnel of shame that you have to walk through. It's kind of a giant spiritual spanking machine. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much for working through the difficulties of not having the screen behind us for the first time like ever. So we just spent the first three weeks wrestling through this idea of these kind of truthful prayer tension spokes, I've been calling them, like in a wheel. <clears throat> and we've looked at eight, we looked at all eight of them the first three weeks, and I'll just run through them real quick. We said, first of all, prayer is first and foremost an issue of faith, right? It's about movement. It's about stringing together instances of faith to, to wrestle forward. I believe, help me in my unbelief. And second of all, we said prayer is not about magic words. God does not have a traumatic past, God does not get triggered. You don't have to deal with God like we deal with each other, like, oh my gosh, if I say this to her, this is not going to go well. I got to word this perfectly. God is not like that. He, he's safe and secure. Number three, God's, prayer has to do with God's will. And the most important aspect here is to remember, God will set the chair up right. God is going to make life perfect and whole. This is his desire. So when we're praying for something that is broken, what we're really doing is asking God to do out there right here. Don't wait is what we're begging him to do. And then we relinquish in that moment knowing we don't know everything that's going on. We don't know what the enemy's doing. We don't know what humanity's doing. We don't always know what God is doing. Fourth, authority is an issue of authority. Excuse me, prayer is an issue of authority. A third of the Trinity, if you've bowed your knee to Jesus, dwells within you. You are clothed with power. Number five, the great old adage, you don't have because you don't ask. We just need to... Keep asking. Start asking and keep asking. Number six, bring others in. Breach the gap with other people. And when we pray as a group, it was funny. It was cool. There was a group of people praying this morning for a couple people for healing. And I knew they were up there, but I kind of had to take care of things down here. And so I was praying at the same time for those people down here. And it's the same thing. I don't need to be in the room necessarily. It's one heart, one Voice And the idea is not to overwhelm God with numbers. It's not like, oh my gosh, we only got nine. If we could have had a tenth, he probably would have listened to us. It's about replicating the three of them. Number seven, familiarity with the holy. That God is the ultimate place of grace, but it is a throne of grace. You belong there if you know Jesus, but you are clearly not like them, Father, Son, and Spirit. And number eight that we looked at last week, the Spirit is actually praying on your behalf. Why? Because you actually don't know how to pray. No matter how much you do this,
No matter how great you get at this, you still have an understanding like a gnat. But don't worry, the Spirit knows everything and is praying for you on your behalf. Each one of these truths working in conjunction with the other truths creates balance as we come to God. And I hope, I just really hope that these truths have, even though they're super difficult, I think, to to grasp, and they're really difficult to lay them right next to one another. Even still, I hope there have been some practical things within these first three weeks um, to, to, to to make your coming to God make more sense, even though they're quite mystical. You are entering into a relationship and a partnership with God Almighty, for heaven's sake. And he's made up of Father, Son, and Spirit, and yet still one. Of course, it is mind-blowing. And then on top of that, you're talking to a God you cannot see, hear, or touch physically. There's no facial expression to watch and know where you sit. And one of the things that we looked at in week one is trying, even in the midst of balancing these truth tensions, to simply acquiesce, to relinquish our tight grip under the wings of the Almighty, to simply sometimes, hopefully possibly every time, to settle into the simple fact that God is good and he's always others focused, which means he's always you focused. So then the question is, what might help us within these eight prayer tensions with our deep lack of sight and understanding, to settle under his wings? Is there, is there something that we can practically do to help us grasp what it means to enter as the fourth, Doug and the Father and the Son and the Spirit? We, when I did the series, it was really part one of this series, when I did it in April, I ended with a Q&A. And um, I don't know that I'm brave enough to do that again. But I did a question, especially because of Michael. And so we did this question and answer. And Tion asked this incredibly vulnerable question right out of the gate. I mean, he launched out of his seat to ask this question. And I'd been sharing how God takes great risks with us as people. That we can get all charged up on a Sunday morning, or Sunday morning. We sense God, we feel God, and then Monday around noon we go, oh my gosh, I have not thought of God once today. And Tion jumped out of his seat and said, how do we fix that? How do I, how do I not go throughout the week without remembering God? It's a great question. I'm not sure I can totally remedy that, but let's try at least... Uh, chip away at that with with an idea this morning that um, I've been wrestling with for a long, long time. And there are, of course, obvious reasons uh, how to bring God into your day. You can do things like literally schedule times of prayer. Like I've shared with you many times, Brian has a 10 o'clock appointment and a 3 o'clock appointment with God. And it brings up an alarm on his his calendar. And at 10 o'clock, he's like, oh, I'm, I'm done. The meeting's done. And he leaves his office. He takes a bunch of verses. He has a whole string of business cards that he's printed his favorite verses on. He'll grab the next stack, put them in his pocket, and he recites from memory these verses. And he just brings God... The, the, the memory of God, if you will, back into his day. Um, we can set times with other people to pray. We can put a post-it note on our mirror, on our dashboard. There's all kinds of things that we can do to make God more of a reality for us. But there is one thing in particular that I've been doing the last 10 plus years that has really revolutionized my prayer life with God. And what it means to enter is the fourth. So I just want to answer two simple questions. The first one is this. How do I enter in more practically as the fourth with God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit? My answer is really quite simple, but it's quite a shift. And I just want to break this down into two pieces. First of all, what I do is I, 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 I do it by personalizing my prayer life with God. So before I explain this, I want to say say something because I tested this with somebody and it didn't go well a month or so ago. Um, And what I want to say is my goal, this is not a rule, what I'm sharing with you this morning. This is more of a devotional thought. And so my desire is not to move your cheese just to move your cheese. I know some of you are very not cheese movers. And so I would hate to do that, although 
It's kind of good for some of you to move your cheese around a little bit. What I really want to do is maybe in a small, powerful way, just make you being the fourth more obvious to you in your soul. Let's face the simple truth. When we pray, when we talk to God, we are coming in one way or another to God to communicate. That means we are coming to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. So this may feel weird when you take this in, and even more strange to kind of implement this. And I would imagine some of you do this, some of you don't, and some of you do an aberration of this, right? But there's a huge difference kind of in this process of my relationship with God, and specifically praying, when I understand who I am addressing. Can I address God with more clarity and more personalization, if you will, in my prayer life? See, God is a title. God is not his name. When we pray to God, even though we may not be thinking it, we are actually addressing the three persons of God in oneness. We are actually, when we say, God, I want you to. God, are you aware? God, I want to share something with you. You are actually at that time praying to God. Now, I know that sounds a little obvious, but you're actually praying to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all at once. Now, again, we may not realize it, but God, again, is the title for the three and oneness. And God is made up of three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when you pray to, again, God, who do you mean in that moment? Do you take thought in that moment who you actually mean? Are you actually meaning to address all three of them at the same time? When you pray to the Father, are you actually thinking about who within the Trinity you are addressing? Or do you bounce between, say, the Father and Jesus and Lord and God and Lord and back to Father and back to Jesus in a convoluted way such that you're not even sure who you're talking to? I get it. I spent my whole life doing this. There's nothing wrong with it, by the way. Again, there are no magic words, right? So don't feel bad about it. I just want to see if I can bring clarity I think often when someone prays to God, they don't necessarily even think about that question, who am I actually talking to? Again, there's nothing wrong with addressing him as God, but in the Bible, when people addressed God, it was a much more personal thing than this. So the question is, how does this work? When we give our lives to Jesus, we are called into a family, the family of the Trinity. Families and the idea of family is an extremely powerful force. Unfortunately, on earth, here, not always, are families for the good. But they're meant to be a place, families, where we are right, loved, when we're, where we're accepted, where we're taken care of, where we're allowed to come into our own shape and size and, and in safety be ourselves. My family personally, the McBride family, greatly shaped me. It, of course, wasn't perfect, but there are so many beautiful things that took place in that family that shaped me. And many of you might kind of cringe inside or groan inside when I say that because you had just the opposite, possibly, of that. You see, in my family, I always felt loved. I always felt safe. I never worried about whether I was going to be abused or treated poorly. I never felt physically unsafe, emotionally unsafe. I was always provided for. I always knew my parents were proud of me the whole time. Well, if we have received the payment of Jesus' blood, we have been called into his family as the fourth, as it were. As I said last week, we have a seat at the dinner table with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And in this new family, we have a new, perfect, and intended Father. Jesus is our elder brother, 
And the Holy Spirit, ah, the crazy Holy Spirit, is the one that helps us accept our full adoption rights when we receive him at salvation. And there's this myriad of beautiful blessings that the Spirit brings. Let me just read a few excerpts. Again, not on the screen, so you're actually going to have to keep staring at me. I apologize. A beautiful uh, bunch of verses about what this, this, this adoption looks like. Galatians chapter 4, verse 5. To redeem those who were under the law so that they might receive adoption as sons and daughters. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son and daughter. And if a son and daughter, then you are an heir through God. John chapter 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of the living God. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 for in Christ Jesus you for in Christ Jesus you are all sons and daughters of God through faith Romans 8:14 for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons and daughters of God for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry daddy father The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Messiah. How incredible is this? God no longer associates you with your earthly family. God no longer associates you with your earthly last name. You are his and he is yours. The three of them, Father, Son, and Spirit. So when I address God, I normally do not address the three, but rather I address them one at a time. I normally, when I pray now, think about who within the Trinity that I am addressing, meaning when I pray, and I normally, either to the Father or to Jesus or even sometimes to the Spirit, will actually direct my prayers. So the first aspect of this is I personalize my prayer to the specific person within the Trinity that I'm talking to. Second of all, I then allow their specific roles to drive my prayer. You see, each person within the Trinity plays a very different role than the other. They are all God, but they are also distinct persons, which I know is mind warping, but it is true. So we have to keep wrestling with this. And so when... Or, and or how do I address each one of them individually? Well, let me just throw a few things out to get you started. And this is by no, no, no uh, terms exhaustive. First of all, we'll start with the Father. The Father in the Bible is the center of the family. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. You see, the father is the center of the new family. This is kind of that Uhtred, son of Uhtred, if you watch that series. I am now Doug, son of the living father. This is how I am known. And what is this father like? That's the question. What is his role within the Trinity? Well, let me just mention two quick things. First of all, in scripture, the father is the architect. He is the planner. He is the designer of all things. He's the future holder, if you will. The Father sets the path. He sets the will for all of life. In fact, Jesus in the New Testament, this is so strange to me, but the New Testament says that Jesus doesn't even know the hour or the time that he will come back to get us Because he doesn't know. Isn't that weird? You know who knows? The father. Because he's the architect. He's the planner. I think that sounds crazy, but it's super cool. The the future is held in the father's hands. Your future 
is held in the father's hands. The second part about him is he's a dad. So what does that mean? Well, I typically go to the father when I'm wrestling with plans and decisions and design and ideas about the future, the need to move forward when I'm not sure how, where my future is headed. I go to the Father for provision and for protection. Those are just a few examples. Basically, he's my dad. He's an older, wiser, deeply invested, deeply caring dad that believes in me. He wants the best for me. He trusts me, and he wants my life to work. Isn't that cool? He's my dad. Well, what about Jesus in this new family? Jesus is my elder brother. Jesus is the, he's, he's the contractor, if you will. And when I say Jesus was a contractor, you think, okay, Jesus worked with his hands. He, he chipped basalt, volcanic rock in, in, uh, in, in Nazareth as he grew up. And that's true, but that's not what I mean. Jesus is the contractor. Jesus built everything that you know of, and then some. He built the universe. Colossians chapter one says this, John chapter one says this. So Jesus gets how I'm built. Cell by cell by cell, my DNA, all of it, Jesus wired within me, personally within the Trinity. Jesus is the one within the Trinity that always shows up, by the way, of the three of them on earth. Jesus is the one that came down in Genesis and had lunch with Abraham. Jesus is the one that came down and wrestled with Jacob all night long. And ultimately, Jesus is the one that birthed himself into humanity through a woman, and he walked out my life, the most difficult human life you could ever walk out, he lived, and he died a brutal death. By the way, death, the one thing we all share in common. We're all headed there. I had a doctor appointment this week, but my, my primary care doc is a really good friend of mine. And I was processing what it is to be 60. And I said, you know, 60, JB, is, I've, here's what I figured out. 60 is not about succeeding anymore. It's not about competing. It's not, it's not about ego. It's not about anything other, uh, any of that stuff. It's about adapting. Like it's really just about adapting to this new life, adapting to a new schedule, and adapting to a new body. I said, here's the problem, JB. I don't know what I'm adapting to. I don't know what normal is. He goes, oh, I'll tell you, there is no normal at 60. I said, what do you mean? And he put his hand up, and he went like this. <laughs> and, I, and I knew exactly what he meant. He, he said, this is what you're, you want your doctor to say to you in a physical. You're in decline and really reassuring. And you will be in decline, Doug, now until you die. And for some reason, I walked out feeling much lighter. It felt great. It was a dose of reality for me. Jesus gets that. It says in Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Tempted? as we are, and yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to his throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of our need. See, Jesus walked my life out. Jesus knows the life of a human being. So I typically go to Jesus when I'm wrestling with physical struggles. Human struggles, temptation, focus, being present in the moment, all the things that come with being this. And I go to Jesus for that. It's really cool. And then what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is, is described in Hebrew in the Bible as our azer, as our helper. But it's, 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 it's so much stronger than our, our English word for helper. He's, He's the great come alongsider. He's the actuator is the word that I usually use. The scriptures say the spirit performs all of these roles in our life. The spirit comforts. The spirit encourages, which means the, the spirit is trying to put courage inside of us. 
The Spirit, the, the Spirit teaches us. And then the Spirit reminds us what we've already learned because we keep forgetting. He leads us. He dwells within us. He fills us. He reveals. He empowers. He guides us. And he, and he brings the truth to us. He is the engagement ring of the Trinity to us that they will never leave us or forsake us. He prays for us, and especially when we don't even know how to pray. So I typically turn to the Spirit when, say, I don't know how to pray when I don't know what I need, when I don't know what somebody else needs, when I don't have a, feel like I have a present guide and I need someone to lead me to truth. I spend all morning here while you're, while you're singing, praying that the Spirit will bring clarity to you and me, that he will teach you and remind you the truth of what it is to be a member of their family. This is how I go to the Spirit. Now, I will say this. Prayer to the Father it should be acknowledged, is where the weight of emphasis falls in the New Testament, Revelation. The Father is our Abba. The Father is our dad or our daddy. But they each play different roles in our life. And they are each one of them persons. The Spirit of God is not an it. It is not the Father, the Son, and the Holy It. (laughs) The Spirit is a person just like the Father and the Son. So one other question that we should ask, because we do this in this church, is there biblical precedence to do this, or are you just going off in a weird cheese-moving mode? Well, I think there is. We already know, because we've seen this massive number of, of examples, like, say, the Lord's Prayer, that praying to the Father is a very normal thing. And this was done all over the Old Testament, too. We know what the Lord's Prayer is. Our Father who art in heaven. All over the place we see this, and we see Jesus as a man praying to the Father. So the real question is, is it okay to pray to Jesus? Is it okay to pray to the Spirit? By the way, I Google searched this like six weeks ago, and there were actually people that said, you absolutely cannot pray to the Spirit. You absolutely cannot pray directly to Jesus, which I think is complete nonsense. But that's just my thought. So why? Why do I think it's okay? I'll give you kind of a theological answer and I'll give you a, like a specific couple specific references. First of all, kind of theologically, prayer is talking to God. And if Jesus was, as the scriptures present him, the, the one person who is truly God and was also truly human, then how could praying to this Jesus be wrong as my high priest? You see, the same argument applies to me, to the Holy Spirit, even though, by the way, I can't find a place in the scriptures where somebody prayed directly to the Spirit. I don't, I can't find one. Doesn't mean it's wrong. I'm not going to build a theology just because of that. Um, I just couldn't find it. But again, I want you to think what they, Father, Son, and Spirit are like, just theologically. When Jesus was here, he could not stop bragging about the other two. Oh, my father in heaven, he would say. Oh, my father in heaven. Or he would say, oh gosh, you guys are all fascinated with me. I'm a schlep. Wait till you see the spirit come. Wait till you see what the spirit, the spirit's gonna do way more than I've ever done before. And by the way, the father and the spirit do the same thing. They can't stop talking about the other two. The Father, behold my son, my beloved son in whom I am just enamored with and well pleased, the Father said. Can you imagine any one of the three being not being tickled to death if you went to the other two? Could you imagine the Father saying, I'm a little upset you went to the Spirit with that one. Like, I'm kind of a needy father, He's not, remember? No magic words. He's got broad shoulders. He knows who he is. And the father is more, almost more enamored with the son and the spirit than he is with himself. And the other two are just like this. They're others focused. Now, there's, scriptural, uh, there's scripture all over the, Bi- uh, the Bible to, to, to back this up too, by the way. Think of the Christian martyr Stephen in the book of Acts, Acts chapter seven. While they were stoning Stephen to death, He sees the risen Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. 
as an advocate for him. And others focused to the end. Stephen, he asked Jesus to forgive those who are doing this. He says literally in verse 60, Lord, Jesus, please don't hold this against them. As they're killing him. In 1 Corinthians, Paul describes Christians as those who call on Jesus' name. It says this in 1 Corinthians. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sacrificed in Christ Jesus, call to be the saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus both our Lord and our King. Revelation, the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and the last chapter of Revelation, this is the prayer. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And we just read in Hebrews, depicting Jesus as our great high priest, who represents us to God and God to us, meaning God the Father. So again, why do I do this? When I pray, why am I so specific who I'm talking to? First of all, it personalizes God to me. God is very personal, folks, very personal. And it's okay to address him as God, but it's a little not personal. It's like somebody calling me Mr. McBride. I really, it's, it's respectful, but I'd rather you call me Doug. Um, it's sweet, people call me pastor, I prefer to be called Pastor Doug. I like my name. It's very personal. I like to be known and I like to know the other person. So talking to God, not as an it, but as a father and a son and a spirit, deeply personalizes God to me. Second of all, doing this will help you see if you're less comfortable with one of the persons of the Trinity. What do I mean by that? You will find, many of you, that you you say, okay, maybe I had a lousy upbringing. Maybe my father was a horrible person. Or, Or particularly for women, I have had horrible experiences with men. And so the the thought of praying maybe to to Jesus feels safe in the spirit, but praying to God as a father, ah, that's a little uncomfortable for me. We should find that out. Because what you're uncomfortable with does not match the living God you're praying to in that that situation. Our father is good, and he wants only the best for you. Or you might say, I'm very comfortable with praying to the father, but it's, it's kind of weird praying to Jesus directly as my elder brother. Sort that out with him. Let that relationship develop between you and God. And God is father, son. And spirit. And finally, by personalizing God, I more naturally enter in now as the fourth. Let's pray. Father, how will we start with that? You are so personal. All of these things that sit within us naturally that want to connect that want to be known, that that puts within us this feeling for another human that is so big sometimes we cannot put it into words. This all comes from you. This comes from the three of you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We recognize that. We appreciate that. Thank you for being so immense and yet being so close. Thank you for being so, oh, just utterly beyond us and yet so deeply close. May we as a people become more comfortable with you as we realize how comfortable you are with us. And we pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said.